Guard clauses on the surface sound like a great idea. They allow you to reduce conditional complexity by exiting a method or a function early. However, how I see guard clauses being used in the real world, I find a little value. Oftentimes, they're just polluting application level code with really trivial preconditions. I'm gonna refactor some code to move those preconditions to the edge of your application so that your domain can actually focus on business concerns. Hey everybody, it's Derek Kilmartin from CodeOpinion.com. I post all kinds of videos on software architecture and design, so if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. To illustrate this, I'm gonna be refactoring the eShop on web sample application. If you're a member to my YouTube or Patreon, you'll get access to the source code and the changes that I'm making, as well as a private Discord server. So if you're ever interested in joining, check out the links in the description. So the most common guard clause you probably see everywhere or have you written yourself are null checks. So in this solution, there's kind of three projects I'm really gonna be looking at. So there's web, which is ASP.NET Core, there's infrastructure, which contains entity framework, and then there's application core, which is basically kind of the, the center of our heart of our application, which kind of has all the logic in it. So I'm gonna look at first under services and let's look at the basket service. So here we're gonna likely find some guard clauses. Here's our first one. So set quantities, we're making sure that the actual quantities dictionary isn't null. Um, if we go down farther, their transfer basket, we can see anonymous ID and username. These are checking against null. And if we go into the order service, we have some null checks here. We have some extension. Um, so this one's probably okay. But so often you'll just see these null checks as kind of these guard clauses preconditions. And this is what I'm saying while well, the are in our application core. And the thing that I find most interesting uh, about these kind of null checks, these guard clauses, is that they're not consistent usually. Some places, some methods will have them, some methods might not. So deciding where you're actually implementing them is kind of on a whim or during a review of, oh, you didn't add that guard clause. Rather, what I'm gonna do here in this refactor is I'm gonna remove all these guard clauses and push them out of application core so that they're specifically only in web, which is kind of the edge of our application. So what I mean by edge is within any application, you have some type of input. In this example, our edge really is ASP.NET Core. So when a client makes a request, really what I wanna do is I wanna move those, like I'm saying, these trivial, trivial null checks, these type of things, these trivial types of preconditions, I want them only really to exist in the edge, in ASP.NET Core. So that what happens is when the ASP.NET Core, whatever the edge is, that could be ASP.NET Core, that could be a different framework, that could be some messaging library that you're interacting with a message broker, and that's kind of kicking off code in your domain. That's the edge, that's the primary way that input is coming in. That's where I want kind of the hard break of the, this trivial stuff. I want that to exist there so that when it requests into our domain, we're kind of always in a valid state. We don't need to be so defensive. We can just use, as you'll see, types that we know are in a good state, that we don't have to litter and pollute all this application code with these ridiculous null checks. So what I'm gonna focus on in this refactor is the username. And these preconditions, these null checks to make sure that it's not null or empty. So it's called username. It's also called in a bunch of different places, buyer ID. So I'm gonna illustrate with that. And the way we're gonna do that is by creating a type that forces this precondition so we can't even have the concept of a null or, or empty username. So if we look at um, basket, for example, this is also what I was illustrating. And there's, that there's no check here. There's no precondition. There's no guard clause here. So what's deciding if we have some other spot that we're making a new instance of the basket, what happens if we don't put that, uh, that guard there? Again, that's kind of what I'm alluding to here is that there's no really rhyme or reason on where we're putting the guard clauses or not. So rather, we're just gonna create a type that forces us into this issue so we don't need to think about the guard clauses. The way we're gonna do that is I'm gonna create a record struct of username that in the constructor, is gonna be doing that precondition. It's gonna be checking to see if it's null or empty, and it's gonna throw if it is. And then I'm just overriding to string. So what's gonna happen is once I start changing all these definitions, we're gonna start failing everywhere because everything is expecting a string. So the rest of this refactor is just gonna be changing what the type is in the signature of what we're expecting.
So if I just build, I can see wherever we're getting compiling errors here where I can see, okay, basket by ID, because that's a username now, order, we have to change this as well. And we can absolutely get rid of this because we don't need that guard clause. Like order had a guard clause, but basket didn't for some reason. So now I can look at the buyer ID, which is not a string, it's a username. And just keep going with like this, just basically building, see where the build errors are. Um, we have some issue here because the uh, buyer ID, again, string, no it's not, it's a username. Uh, so I'm just gonna keep going with this basically. So I fixed everything in application core. We don't need to do any null checks. We don't have to add if any guard clauses related to the username because we're not using a string anymore and it's not gonna be null. So now all my errors, the actual compilation errors here are actually in the web project, which is awesome because that's where the string ultimately lives as you'll see. So if I jump to the basket view model service, we can see that we've got to change this. We can change um, the create basket from user. This is going to be changing to the user ID. And now this is interesting because our view model, we actually don't want to return the concept of a username. We do want it to be a string. And that's why I overrode the two string methods. We can save that and just keep going along here. This one's the same thing. We don't want to change the view model. The count total baskets, this can actually be our username. And our last error up here is just the interface. So these are changing. So this is pretty much what I have to do now with the rest of the web project is just run the build, see what errors we have and what uh, files where we're actually gonna have to start creating the username. Now the first place that actually happens is in the login page here, we have this transfer anonymous basket to user where it accepts a username. But what it's doing here is it's taking the basket, uh, the cookie, and that's what it's giving this anonymous ID. That's a string, obviously, it's coming from a cookie, but we can't be using a string. So what we're gonna be doing is creating a username as well for our anonymous ID and from the username that we're getting here as well. So we're gonna create a new username and these are actually has our preconditions. So if we see where this is actually used, we can see this is actually coming from the form, the input, the email. So we're at the edge here, we're taking our string, we're constructing it into something that we've defined, which is our username. So I fixed all the razor pages, all the errors there, and now I've ran into an issue, an error, specifically in a mediator handler. If you're unfamiliar with Mediator or you're not using C-sharp, I know there's a lot of subscribers that don't, this is how it actually works and how I like to use it or the concept of it. So let's say we have a client or browser and I was mentioning kind of that edge, which is our web framework, in this case, ASP.NET Core. When it sends a request to our web framework, that's an HTTP request in this case. But what I'd really wanna do is I wanna transform that HTTP request into what I call an application request. So there's gonna be this transformation from that into something that we're dealing with within our application. And that's what I think of, uh, of a mediator request as, is really an application request. So we can make that transformation, turn it into using the types that we want, like username, and then we can pass that into our application, into the domain, and be using the types like username that I have defined there. So what that means is, our mediator requests, we don't wanna be using strings that we're dictating kind of the buyer ID username, rather we wanna be using our new username type. So let's keep going with this, is that now that mediator request get my orders, we don't want it to have a string, we want it to actually have a username. And then what we wanna do is where we're actually creating that instance, which is gonna be on the website, let's see, we got our orders controller. This is where we actually wanna create a new instance of our username because this is coming from user identity name, which is part of ASP.NET Core. So we fixed that request, and we're pretty much gonna be doing the exact same thing with any other mediator request. So I've also fixed all the tests, everything's running, everything's passing. I didn't have to change any tests in terms of how they were asserting, but what I do find interesting is that there's some tests within transfer basket, and this is really kind of where we started, where there's two uh, tests to throw given null anonymous ID and throw given null user ID. And these tests now are completely useless because we're not expecting these methods to be doing, uh, to have these guard clauses, because they don't, because the username has it. So like, we're not gonna be passing, for example, a username null, we know that's gonna throw. So these two tests, we can just completely eliminate 
because we don't need to write tests for these um, guard clauses that we're adding everywhere. And rather, we just have a few simple tests for the guard clauses within the construction of the username itself. Generally, I think guard clauses are a good idea. Exit early where you need to. It simplifies all that conditional logic, but push that to the edge. Use types, don't pollute your application code where it's seemingly, even in this example, is kind of undetermined where or where not these guard clauses are actually added. In the basket, it wasn't added. In the order it was or vice versa, I can't even remember which one. There's really no rhyme or reason where they were actually added, especially these null checks. Push it to the edge. That way you can trust within your application code, within your domain logic, that you just can focus on what matters and not be worried about adding guard clauses to every possible method that you have in various different layers throughout your application. And to be clear, I'm talking about the trivial ones, like these null checks, like validating an email address that's in a good format, etc. There was other places within the sample that were very valid. For example, just because the username has some input doesn't mean that it was actually associated to a basket. So when the basket was null, we threw. That was a guard clause that was there in one of the instances. That makes sense. Really what I'm talking about, again, is using these types for these trivial places so you don't have to pollute the rest of your application. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.